Thank you. <laughs> the structure of this panel will be about 15 to 20 minutes of introductions and presentations by our panelists, followed by about 30 minutes of discussion, and then finally a Q&A with the audience. As we go through the presentations and discussion today, I might suggest selecting speaker view in the upper right corner uh, to highlight those who are presenting. If you have a question, please type it into the chat and our host will moderate the Q&A over the next hour. I will then receive those questions uh, towards the end of our hour and ask those to our panelists directly. With this in mind, uh, let's get started. Our first panelist presentation is from Dr. Amy Farrell. Dr. Farrell is the John and Ann Purley Faculty Chair of Liberal Arts and Professor of American Studies and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. She is the author of Yours and Sisterhood, Miss Magazine, and The Promise of Popular Feminism, and Fat Shame, Stigma and the Fat Body in American Culture. She has shared her research on national popular media, including Bitch, The New Yorker, Psychology Today, NPR, CNN, and The Colbert Report. And from 2019 to 2020, served as an American Council of Learned Societies Fellow. She is currently working on a project focusing on key moments in the history of the Girl Scouts of the USA. Ones that illuminate struggles over the meanings of girlhood, feminism, racial equality, empire, and nationalism. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, whenever you're ready, Dr. Farrell. Hi, everyone. It's really wonderful to be here on this panel on weight bias. And I wanted to start by thanking especially Brie for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, and Stacy, who's really been great with organization and all of my uh, fellow panelists, Hannah, Kelsey, and Leslie. I'm really excited to be here. Um, in the next five minutes, I'm actually going to give you a really quick um, history of the roots of fat stigma. And I want to start by saying that fat stigma is firmly rooted in the idea that there are some human beings that are more primitive than other human beings, that there are some human beings that are um, more civilized than other human beings, and that there are some human beings who are more worthy of um, all of the um, rights and possibilities of li living a full life than other human beings, and that those ideas are really um, shaping the experiences of fat people today. And notice, as a fat studies scholar, I do use the word fat. Um, fat people today, but also that permeate all of our fields, in, including, I would argue, the field of nutrition. Um, and that's really what I cover in my book, Fat Shame, not about the field of nutrition, but about this history. Um, if I could get the next uh, slide, please. I want to start um, by just uh, really focusing on the fact that cultural concerns about weight preceded health concerns. Um, the picture that you see on the right is by a man named um, William Banting, who was the father of dieting, I would say, in the Western world. This, his book came out in 1863. He was a very wealthy man, a casket maker, who was very unhappy with his weight and went to his physicians to um, find a way to lose weight. The physicians all said, you're fine. And he disagreed and created this diet for himself that's kind of like the Atkins diet with a laxative. Um, and he became a very, very wealthy man by selling this diet product. The ads on the left are typical ads. These ones are from 1887 um, in magazines like Life Magazine for products like Corpus Lean. These were industrial toxins, arsenic, um, pills that often had tapeworm eggs in them. Um, these were not things about getting healthy, but these were items about getting thin. Um, so again, concerns about weight really preceded health concerns. Um, if I could get the next slide. And it was really kind of very popular within popular culture as well. Um, Charlotte Bronte's 1847 Jane Eyre, if you're familiar with that book, I'm sure many of you have read that, um, was a bestseller in its time in the mid 19th century. And in that book, the heroine um, Jane, who you see pictured on the front of these covers is slim and is white. And the, her antagonist, the woman who's going to prevent her from doing what she wants to do, which is marrying the hero of the book, um, the mad woman in the attic, Bertha, is dark and oversized. And that was a typical kind of trope within popular culture texts of this time period. Um, and physiognomy plays a key role within this novel. If I could get the next um, slide. 
And physiognomy was a, a considered a science in the 19th century. Um, it was, uh, as well as the philosophy, it was the study of human bodies for evidence of caricature traits, um, for evidence of how far up the scale of civilization and the great chain of being or how far down that scale of civilization you were. Um, things like skull size were studied, um, skull shape, nose size, chin size, ear placement, eye placement, obviously skin color, um, sexual um, characteristics, um, and also uh, fatness was one of those um, characters as well. The, the focus was on looking for traits of degeneracy, um, supposedly inherited traits that would show that even if it looked like you were high on that scale of civilization, if you look like you were a person of high standing, you might be holding traits that were ones that would place you lower on that scale of civilization. Um, some of these images are really hard to see, so I should have noted that ahead of time. And the next one is as well, if I could get the next slide. Um, probably uh, what this really came from as well was the birth of what we call today scientific racism. And um, many of you are probably familiar with uh, the really difficult history of uh, the woman we know as Sarah Bartman. Um, she was uh, a Khoihoi woman from the area of the world we now know as South Africa, um, taken by her Dutch um, handlers um, to uh, England and then to France and put on this uh, stage is really kind of a spectacle. And that's what we're seeing in this image here where people um, you know, poked at her and prodded at her and, and studied her as kind of a, as, as a freak. But what's important for us to know though, is that this wasn't just this kind of sideshow, that this was mainstream science as well. Um, the scientist Georges Cuvier, who was held in very great esteem in terms of the scientific enterprise, his name is still all over Paris. If you go to Paris, you'll see his name in buildings and street names. He studied her body before she died. And then after she died, broke rules and took her body for the autopsy. And um, then parts of her body were in the Musée des Hommes until the um, 1990s. And he um, uh, uh, wrote a lot about how her body was clearly um, a deficient body, one that was low on the scale of civilization. And as proof for that, he particularly focused on her skin color, um, on the shape of her uh, brain and skull, and also on her fatness, um, on the shape of her buttocks and on, on uh, the shape of her knees and other parts of her body that were fat. Um, if you're interested in that history connecting, particularly that early history connecting fatness and blackness, I'd really encourage you to look at the scholarship of the scholar um, Sabrina Strings as well. If I could get the next slide. This was such a, a kind of a very prominent idea. Um, these are also very difficult images to look at. Um, Cesare Lombroso and Ferraro were sociologists from uh, Italy. Their work was um, widely translated into many different languages across um, uh, Europe and across uh, um, Northern uh, North America. And the argument was that fat women um, it, that the fatness was a sign of a woman having criminal tendencies, having sexual tendencies of sexual deviancy, having tendencies of proof that she could be um, very likely could be a prostitute, um, even if she appeared to be um, of someone of high, supposedly high class. Um, fat thighs in particular were a sign of potential prostitution, which I always point out is an interesting one since women in general have fatter thighs than men. It meant that every woman was a potential prostitute. Um, and if I could turn to the next slide now. Um, and what I think is, and this is, I know I'm going through this so quickly, but my, my point of pointing out all this historic material, it's interesting, the historic material is, but what's really important for us to note though, is that we haven't lost those ideas, even though it seems like we've lost those ideas, we haven't by any means. Those ideas of um, uh, fat as being a sign of a degenerate body are really connected to contemporary racist ideas and, and to contemporary ideas about fatness. And we see that in lots of different fields, um, for instance, when we hear discussion about the primitive gene that supposedly makes certain people more likely to become fat than other people, all I can think of is that's been a longstanding trope that fat people are more primitive. 
um, than, than thin people. Or this particular documentary is a play which, which quoted psychologists, um, nutritionists, um, physicians as to how fatness was ruining um, the United States and Western civilization in general. Um, uh, that this, the title is a play on the title of the um, 1912 film, Birth of a Nation, which if any of you are familiar with that D.W. Griffith film, um, one of the first films in, in, in the Western world, um, but it also focused on how dangerous black people were to the United States and that they really needed to be um, controlled, even if by the, F, by the KKK and in very, um, uh, violent ways, they really needed to be eradicated. So when I saw this documentary, I thought I really find this important that they're making this connection and horrific that this connection is being made. Um, and if I could just jump to the last slide, um, I'm going to end with some good news here though, which is that it's not as if there's not a lot of resistance to these ideas. And some of that resistance is coming from fat studies scholars like myself and from people on this panel. For me, it's really important for us to highlight this ideology um, so that we can see it. We can't see the ideology, we can't fight the ideology if we can't see it. Um, and that there are other people like Sonia Renee Taylor, um, whose book, um, Your Body is Not an Apology, and she also has a workshops and she has um, a website, really focuses on the idea that the body cannot be a sign of whether or not someone is worthy of a full human life. Um, and I would really encourage you to look at that, um, look at her work if you are if you might be interested in that. So that's it. I know that's fast, but I want to turn it over to my fellow panelists. Thank you so much, Dr. Farrell. Um, our second presentation is from Hannah Corey. Hannah is a registered dietitian and a PhD candidate in nutrition at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Her work focuses on experiences of young people of color and aims to tease apart the links between stigma and discrimination, eating behaviors and chronic disease risk. Hannah is a health policy research scholar with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Prajana Chairs Public Health Nutrition Fellow. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today, Hannah, whenever you are ready. Thank you, Bree, and thanks so much for putting this panel together um, and having me today. Um, as someone whose primary work these days is in nutrition research, I wanted to give a little intro into how the fat phobia that Dr. Farrell was talking about is intertwined with nutrition research. Um, I want to say up front on World Obesity Day that I also use the term fat throughout this presentation because I believe that obesity is a harmful and stigmatizing construct and also because I've been asked to use it instead of euphemisms or harmful language by fat advocates and people involved in fat liberation work. Next slide. So kind of building off of the histories that Dr. Farrell was talking about, in nutrition in the US, we see a history of focusing on the individual over the system. Nutrition as we know it in this country came about in the late 1800s or early 1900s or so. Um, and we see some of the foundational early nutrition work was projects like developing vitamin supplements to address nutritional deficiencies and nutrition education classes, which involved teaching immigrants to embrace US food customs. The part that was left unsaid in this work was that healthful eating would be the way white people ate. And the answer to structural problems, which left some people so poor that they couldn't get adequate nutrients was a pill. From there, the field of nutrition and dietetics was built with little reflection on which foods got demonized and who was considered expert. We see echoes of this today in food guidelines and nutrition education, which more often than not focuses on educating, quote unquote, black and brown children on how to eat healthy, which often ignores these children's histories and food ways and implies their inferiority. So with these roots of the field, it makes sense that this was fertile ground for fat stigmatizing approaches. An emphasis on BMI as a measure of health kind of fits perfectly in that because it not only locates the problem in an individual, but it also very conveniently glorifies white bodies who are more likely to be eating the foods the field is advocating for. Next slide. So that's what I see as some of the issues baked into nutrition research today, but I know that nutrition folks usually also wanna know what that means for us today. So I wanna go through a bit of the research on how fat phobia hurts health. There are a number of factors at play here. First, we know that experiencing stigma is harmful for mental health and there's increasing evidence that it's harmful for physical health as well. Um, common coping strategies for this stress include disordered eating and weight cycling health issues, um, which are 
a common response, especially since our field often gives off the message that body weight is a personal choice. Um, because of all of these factors stacked against them, fat people are likely to need medical care. And once they enter the healthcare system, they're more likely to receive substandard care. They're more likely to get false negatives, that is, be told they don't have anything wrong with them, even if they do, um, and false positives where they're prescribed a medication or intervention simply because the doctor recognizes them as fat and not because they actually have an issue. All of that in turn leads to avoidance of seeking care because no one should have to choose between their dignity and their health. Um, my research specifically focuses on understanding how these processes play out in adolescence, especially in terms of impacts on disordered eating and weight cycling in Black and Latinx young people. Next slide. So we're finally seeing research in the past five to 10 years that increasingly shows that weight discrimination is a missing link in the association between BMI and health outcomes. We see that discrimination and stigma mediate the association between BMI and various measures of health. To me, these studies bring into question whether we've been accurately measuring and modeling the links between body weight and health. With that in mind, if we wanna be responsible clinicians and researchers, we have to start acknowledging that as a field, we may have gotten things wrong for a long time and that even our well-meaning work can have unintended consequences that harm fat people. Next slide. So my research is especially aimed at addressing the following gaps in literature. First, the lack of research that centers Black and Latinx young people's experiences of both eating disorders and weight stigma. Um, and also the fact that the research that does exist is primarily in young women and doesn't acknowledge male identifying folks. There's also a lack of qualitative work understanding the experiences of weight stigma and disordered eating in Black and Latinx young people. We need more work that allows young people, especially Black and Brown young people, to explain their experiences themselves instead of academics theorizing about them. Lastly, there's a need for more research for and by fat people. Fat people are often only invited into the research process if it is a study about weight loss or their experiences around weight loss. Few and far between are the studies asking questions by fat people, not just about fat people. We do need to make sure we're a field that recognizes the humanity of all people. Working to no longer exclude these per perspectives of fat people, I think is a fundamental first step in reckoning with our history and missteps as a field. Um, that's all I have for now, but I'm really looking forward to chatting more about this in our panel discussion. Thank you so much, Hannah. Our next presentation is from Dr. Leslie Williams. Dr. Williams is a family medicine physician and a health equity advocate. After years of working in the eating disorder field, she noted that many of the body issues she was seeing in her patients were linked to negative messages they were internalizing since early childhood regarding their appearance. She discovered that it, that it was difficult to combat these ingrained messages after so many years of programming. Dr. Williams decided to switch gears and focus her energy from eating disorder treatment to prevention. She determined that the best way to address these concerns was to become an advocate for positive body image and size diversity in young children. In doing so, she authored a children's book, Free to Be Me, Self-Love for All Sizes. Her hope is that advocating for health at every size or haze will ultimately improve the physical and mental well-being of all children as well as adults. Thank you for being here with us today and whenever you're ready, Dr. Williams. Thanks, Bree. Thank you for the invitation and for that warm introduction. So I'm very excited to be with all of you today and kind of um, talk about this important topic. And so um, I'm going to start with, and I have it in quotes, the war on obesity and how that has really um, kind of played a role in further integrating weight stigma into our healthcare system. And as Dr. Farrell um, so eloquently pointed out, this is nothing that is new. Um, it's really something that's evolved over time. So we went from, you know, um, those great illustrations of kind of like this scientific racism and weightism to um, now changing it into these terms of, of combat. Um, next slide, please. So um, as I stated, I will be using the term obesity and putting it in quotes only to identify kind of the nomenclature that is currently being used. And um, when I do refer to that, it does not mean that I myself personally um, believe that we should be um, attaching a disease um, 
moniker to people that have um, fall above a BMI of 30. Um, and so I just wanted to make that disclaimer, but again, um, using that term as it relates to this conversation. Next slide, please. So if this truly were a war, we would be losing it, right? We know the data supports the fact that there have been changes in body sizes and shapes um, over time. And it's it, it has everything to do with what's going on with the society as a whole and not the individual. Although, as was previously mentioned, um, the way that the field has been, medical as well as nutrition fields, is this idea of assigning kind of um, personal blame. And when we think about the definition of a war, it requires a conflict between, between two groups involving hostilities of considerable duration and magnitude. And I believe as we've kind of gone through the historical perspective that this idea idea of war against fatness um, really does kind of fit the bill of long-term um, hostility. Next slide, please. So when we think about war, we have to have an identified enemy, right? And when you are a person living in a larger body, you have no um, recourse but to recognize that you are the target of that combat. And it's especially um, difficult for children. You can imagine there was so much in um, the popular media about this kind of war on childhood obesity. And as a child growing up in a larger body, we have no other option but to interpret that as this is a war on me. Next slide, please. Um, and it's especially difficult when we talk about black um, and brown children and this idea of having multiple um, aspects of my personal being that um, the society as a whole sees as negative and is actually trying to eradicate size, gender, you know, race, all of those things kind of growing up with the weight of feeling that those things are um, somehow unacceptable. And I think it was really interesting when we look at um, how the COVID-19 has evolved over the past year plus, it initially when a lot of the um, studies came out, there was this, you know, hey, this is something that um, primarily affects um, fat, black, and brown people. And you literally could hear almost like a sigh of relief across the world of like, as long as I don't fit that criteria, it doesn't apply to me. And for those people that do, it further perpetuates that idea that um, society is trying to eradicate me and they're not concerned about um, how um, systematically um, people that look like me are being impacted and eliminated. Next slide, please. So again, as I mentioned, when we, um, you hear a lot of reference to obesity as an epidemic, and um, it says an epidemic is a sudden widespread occurrence of a particular undesirable phenomenon. So we know that, um, as I mentioned before, it's been longstanding because of all of the sociocultural um, issues that are happening within our society with, you know, being less active, not farming, all of these things um, that weights have changed over time. So it's nothing that has occurred suddenly, but to the society as a whole, who is really trying to uphold this idea that thin whiteness is the ideal, it is considered an undesirable um, phenomenon. And so that's interesting that they, um, utilize that obesity epidemic um, nomenclature, which is not 100% accurate. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, this is especially impactful for young, young children. Um, this um, picture here was an example of some of the billboards that were being put up in certain areas of the country um, with, and there was a true belief that this type of advertising was somehow helpful in um, how we were reaching young children and somehow shaming them into changing their natural body weight and shape. Next slide, please. So this idea or this evolution from um, systematic racism and weightism to this war on obesity and trying to um, push the agenda that this is something that is deeply steeped in um, a concern about healthcare is just not the case. It really is just um, a, a new presentation of weight stigma or fat phobia. And when we define weight stigma, it's weight bias or weight discrimination, stereotyping based on a person's size, and it can manifest 
manifest as fat phobia or disliking or um, the dislike or fear of being or becoming fat. And as was previously mentioned, this weight stigma occurs in a variety of different settings and healthcare and um, nutrition offices are among those. Next slide, please. And when we poll um, in the US adults, over 40% report some type of history of weight stigma, experiencing it in some um, way, shape or form. And so um, next slide, please. And again, why is it used? Why is this something that we, even though there's plenty of research as was previously mentioned, that this is something that is actually detrimental to health. And if the whole reason that we're concerned about someone's size is because we believe that a larger size is unhealthy, then why are we using something that is harmful um, in our minds in an effort to try and change them? And um, really it's, it's often propagated and tolerated in society because there's this belief that somehow the utilization of stigma and shame will be a motivating factor when we um, know and the research continues to conclude that that is not the case. It actually has um, the opposite effect on um, health outcomes. Next slide, please. And again, as was previously mentioned, when we're looking at um, people that experience varying stigmas, it's this idea of overlapping stigma that really impacts their overall um, mental and physical health. Next slide, please. And it's a actually a psychological contributor to higher weight. So this idea that utilizing stigma to somehow change someone's weight, um, the research just recognizes that that is not accurate. And what I challenge us all to do is to change the focus from weight to just encouraging everybody to um, live their happiest, healthiest life, especially for children. And, you know, that's where the idea of haze comes in is that idea that you can be happy and healthy at all sizes. And we need to learn to embrace size diversity instead of this um, kind of archaic um, push to put everyone into an acceptable area on the BMI scale. Next slide, please. Again, this just further um, supports that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so in summary, if we care about health, we should care about weight stigma. So I'm so excited for this conversation today for us to explore how weight stigma is both a social, as both an issue as it pertains to social justice as well as public health. And I hope that we can all be advocates um, for this idea of um, embracing health at every size and size diversity. And I think that's it for me. Wonderful, thank you very much. So our final presentation is from Kelsey Rose. Kelsey is a leadership is a leadership education and adolescent health nutrition fellow at Boston Children's Hospital. She recently graduated with a Master of Public Health degree from the University of Michigan and completed her dietetic training in the treatment of eating disorders at Simmons University. Kelsey strives to be both an eating disorder clinician and a prevention researcher. She is passionate about deconstructing norms around traditional ideas of health and wellness so that all individuals may find a space to care for their minds and body. Kelsey's work focuses on promoting body diversity and changing, challenging the swag, skinny, white, affluent girls stereotype that limits the recognition and treatment of eating disorders. During her free time, you can find her outside with her dog, Eveline, or reading a good book. And thank you so much for being with us today, Kelsey, whenever you are ready. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. As Brie just mentioned, my name is Kelsey Rose. Um, and I just wanted to extend a quick thank you to Brie and Stacy for organizing this event, my fellow panelists for the important work they're contributing to the field, and um, to you all for being here today. So as Brie mentioned, my background is in public health and nutrition, and I currently work clinically in adolescent health with individuals across the weight spectrum, um, specializing in the prevention and treatment of eating disorders. And I wanted to orient you to um, how I came into the field um, with a little background. So during my graduate studies in public health nutrition and dietetics, I was fortunate to have a very unique educational experience. In my first semester, I stumbled into an elective course entitled Eating Disorder Prevention and Treatment, taught by Dr. Kendrin Sonneville. 
And it was thanks to this class that I was exposed to coursework that would empower me to think critically about the way curriculum in the field of dietetics and public health taught ideas of health, health equity, and bodies, really highlighting the pervasive nature of weight bias within the two disciplines. And so I began to feel momentum to not only question the ethics and misconceptions being perpetuated in my coursework, but also consider what change would look like moving forward. It was during this time that an article was passed on to me by Tilka and all that provided concrete examples and conceptual framework for how we are approaching health currently, why it was problematic, and what we could be doing differently moving forward. And I thought this would be um, a helpful thing to share with you now. So the way we currently approach health is entitled the weight normative approach. And it makes the assumption that weight is the main determinant of health. It ignores the idea that there's natural body diversity among the population, and it places personal responsibility on the individual for their size with a focus on body altering behaviors such as dieting or exercise with the intention to shrink one's body. And this last point um, makes the assumption that notifying someone of their weight will help motivate um, them to change it. And the, what the literature shows is actually the opposite. By notifying someone of their weight, we see um, fewer endorsed health behaviors, greater internalization of weight bias, and failed dieting attempts that result in greater weight gain over time. So it's important to consider how this current approach, the weight normative approach, perpetuates the idea that there should be limited body variability within the population, how our current framework affects quality of care across the weight spectrum, and how this current framework suggests unsustainable and potentially harmful interventions. Specifically on this last point, um, we have over half a century of data from when the set point theory was originally established that shows that the body seeks to function at a certain level of adiposity. And so weight suppression will re result in weight regain. That weight cycling is harmful and results in cardiovascular disease and greater all-cause mortality. And lastly, that dieting is directly related to eating disorder pathology. So given this evidence, it's essential to consider whether our current approach to health upholds the non-malevolence principle that as, a healthcare, as healthcare leaders and practitioners, we all have the responsibility to uphold. So what's the alternative? Um, it's entitled the weight inclusive approach, and it argues that health behaviors not weight should be the focal point for medical treatment or intervention. It assumes that everybody is capable of achieving health and well being, that everyone should have access to non stigmatizing health care, which, let's be honest, <laughs> should apply to whether you choose to adhere to um, health norms or not. And it challenges the idea that BMI is anything other than kilograms over meter square. It does not reflect health behaviors, health status, or a set of moral characteristics. An example of weight inclusive of the weight inclusive movement is health at every size or haze, which believes in promoting health rather than weight management. It, it, it encourages eating flexibly, finding movement that feels good, and recognizing um, natural body diversity. And so before I turn this back to Brie, I wanted to provide a few thoughts around what this paradigm shift, shift from a weight normative to a weight inclusive approach might look like moving forward in practice. In terms of education, I am advocating for a weight inclusive curriculum that acknowledges natural body diversity, similar to Han as Hannah spoke about earlier. And clinically focusing on um, health, not weight. And, and just as an aside, I think it's really important to, to, to um, talk about checking your biases and because sometimes clinically, um, if you are going to normalize eating ice cream for a thin bodied ch child, that should happen across the weight spectrum. Um, it's also important if you do have to talk about weight, understanding that um, everyone's lived experience is different and weight, for lack of a better word, carries like um, a lot of shame and stigma. And so being mindful about asking about preferred terms. 
And lastly, um, it means processing the information that we've shared um, here with you today and being curious moving forward, taking the, the time to explore your own biases and educating yourself around how you could change the way you approach health moving forward. Thank you for your time and I, I look forward to our discussion. Great, thank you so much. And thank you uh, everybody for your excellent presentations. I'm going to jump in now to our discussion portion. Um, this first question is for Dr. Farrell. Dr. Farrell, why is it so important to understand and discuss these social cultural influences of body ideals uh, and body image? And sort of a follow up a question from that, how might we draw more people into the fold uh, to understanding this history? So not just nutrition professionals, but society and um, anyone who could benefit from, from knowing this? Yeah, I think those are great questions. And actually the sessions, the, the, the talks that went after mine, I think illuminate it. Because if we don't understand that history, we, um, it's, it's like the air we're breathing, we're not necessarily seeing it, do you know? And so we really need to understand um, that these ideas are so deeply rooted that they're not, and, and if we just sort of um, like cutting a plant off at the top, if we just cut the plant off at the top, but, but the roots are still strong, they will just come back and flourish. So we have to be, I think, really mindful that these ideas are, are rooted in a, a kind of belief that there are beings there, that some human beings are more deserving of life than other human beings. And that that gets mapped onto particular kinds of bodily traits. Um, and that people will do extraordinary things, um, dangerous things to their bodies in order to achieve those kinds of standards. Um, and it's connected to ideas about class and gender um, and, and especially race. Um, and so, you know, to me, it's really important to understand those ideas or they will continue to haunt us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, yeah, I think that would be my main, my main point there. Absolutely, um, definitely agree with that. And sort of a follow-up uh, towards Hannah, do you see any specific opportunities for transmitting these messages in the nutrition field, nutrition research specifically? So how can we ensure that nutrition professionals are aware of this extensive history? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting points is that I did not learn about any of this history in my training. I did my undergrad in human biology with an emphasis in nutrition. I did my master's in nutrition. Um, the course that Kelsey took at Michigan wasn't there when I was there. Um, but I really had to kind of seek it out myself. And as Dr. Farrell talked about, there's that amazing work by Sabrina Strings now that really brings to light some of this. Um, I think there are other scholars who are doing work in fat studies that are making it more possible to teach this in class in a you know, rigorous and evidence-based way. Um, but I think we also have to consider like what that means for professionals who aren't going through training. Mm -hmm. um, I think we definitely need to, like I would love to see like a history of nutrition class being a part of like the dietetics curriculum. Um, because I think I didn't full, like I knew, I felt like some things were off in my training, um, but it really wasn't until later when I took courses with like Nancy Krieger at Harvard, where I was like, oh, this is based in eugenics. This is like, that's A, B. Um, and I think part of that is I, when I was a clinician and working in Metro Detroit area, I remember really distinctly, like an aha moment for me was I was working with a patient um, and they said, you know, Miss Hannah, like, I feel like I come in this clinic and everyone is trying to make me white and I'm just never going to be white. Um, and that has always really stuck with me because as someone who is from a mixed heritage background, but presents as white, I had thought that was kind of a tension I felt for myself just because I was maybe navigating, but it, I was like, oh, this is something everybody is feeling and especially people who are minoritized and marginalized. Um, and that was kind of a highlighting moment for me. And I think that there, that needs to be more explicit in nutrition research and education, that this came out of trying to teach immigrants to not have their food ways anymore, you know, trying to teach Native Americans not to have their food ways. Um, and if we were able to recognize that, like Dr. Farrell said, we would recognize that this is still showing up in ways and that we've just kind of found ways to 
transform it, but that we might still have similar underpinnings. And if we can question that and interrogate that, we might be able to do it in a more responsible and ultimately helpful way. One thing I wanted to add to that too is when you when you come at it from that historical perspective, it it really challenges people to think about where these ideas came from because they're so do, deeply rooted. People really believe that it comes from science, you know. So when I have that conversation with people about the BMI, physicians get really angry and upset when you try to challenge that. And I'm like, do you even know where that? number came from and, and who developed it and that it's not it's not based in any type of evidence. And so um, when you bring that historical perspective, it helps them to really challenge because they it's just so deeply rooted that they believe truly that it is based in fact. Absolutely. All excellent points. And you know I uh, have been working in kind of the weight stigma eating disorder field since my master's, but I recently it was Serena Strings book that really changed my perspective and was the first time um, that I, I was aware of all of this. So I think, you know, we all can learn to your point, Hannah, it's not just during training, but throughout our, throughout our careers, always an opportunity to do that. Um, so thank you everyone for, for your answers. Um, Dr. Williams, this, this next question is for you. Uh, could you speak more about why it is so important to highlight the impact of weight bias and stigma on children and adolescents specifically? Um, so a lot of your work highlights how children have internalized these messages from such a young age. Would you mind expanding on that? Sure. I think that, um, you know, from my work with eating disorders and in the field, it, there's so much emphasis put, I think, on later adolescents. It's, it's kind of like this belief that body image um, miraculously appears in high school when in actuality, when you kind of um, really talk to kids and kind of dial it back, those messages are planted really as early as preschool. I mean, my daughter was in preschool when she was verbalizing, you know, dissatisfaction with her body and we just ignore it and we ignore it and we ignore it. And then by the time that we try and do some type of formal intervention, or it has blossomed into a full-blown eating issue, um, we try to address it. And yet, you know, that foundation was laid at a very early stage when they made those connections in terms of food and their body and movement. And so I think that if we open the door to earlier conversations and this whole idea of embracing body and food diversity. And like, um, we start that at an earlier age and really kind of um, change those foundational messages. I think it's a lot easier than when we try to work on it after the fact, when someone is later on in adolescence or as an adult. And so that's why I think that, um, you know, this belief that, you know, younger kids don't think about that or don't worry about that is inaccurate. And um, I think that there's a lot of missed opportunities with working with um, children at younger ages. Mm. Yeah, I must definitely agree with that. And thank you for sharing um, you, you know, your story with your daughter. I think I um, really appreciate having personal narratives in there as well. Um, this next question is for Kelsey. Uh, you mentioned some current efforts to mitigate the impact and effects of weight bias. So, for example, you touched upon the weight inclusive frameworks and haze or health at every size. Um, in your opinion and in your professional career, do you think these frameworks are effective in reducing the impact of weight bias? Are we doing enough? Can these make a difference? And how do we know? That's a great question. So I have a two part answer and I would say that um, the first part might be a little bit more negative and it has nothing to do with um, those approaches, but rather how how delayed our um basically what we're, this conversation we're having right like th these these ideas are so ingrained um when i work with adolescents specifically in my in my clinic where um, we do take a haze approach and i tell them um that my job is not to help them lose weight but rather to help them like find a way that they feel good in their body and like understand what health means to them they're obviously disappointed and it happens again and again and again and it's it's incredibly disheartening to think that um, on a daily basis, like really on an hourly basis, I have to to like reestablish um, some sort of like independence and autonomy in individuals and adolescents for them to feel like their body is not a problem. So I would say that these approaches do have the potential to work, but unless we change the conversation we're having around health and bodies um, worldwide and 
specifically earlier on, like Dr. Williams was talking about, we're always going to be fighting upstream to try to like um, re reestablish these ideas. And it's not impossible. Um, I do it on a daily basis, but it takes a lot more time to convince somebody that they have been taught um, the wrong thing for like 15 years of their life, um, especially with just the amount of messages that adolescents are receiving. Um, but there's a, a lot of data to show that when you take um, a more inclusive approach to health, that individuals um, do have greater satisfaction with their body and um, their positive health outcomes. Um, but specifically within the adolescent population, answering that question, I think it is a little bit difficult. And I can imagine that um, in older adults, it would be the same thing, except for you now I have to, um, they have to unlearn a message they've learned for 40 years of their life. So I think it's really about us getting behind these conversations and having them earlier um, and, and reshaping the way nutrition is taught. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I, for the sake of time, I'm going to switch over. We're getting some really excellent questions in the chat. So I'm going to start implementing some audience Q&A here. Um, some of them are directed and some are more broad. So I'll let you guys know um, how, that, how that plays out. This was specifically directed um, towards the dietetics field, but uh, I'd actually like to um, ask it in the, in the medical field, nutrition, public health, um, any of the fields that we're kind of all intersected in. How does the lack of diversity in, in our fields impact some of these current messages around weight and weight stigmatization? What suggestions do you have for how our fields can address this. Is it okay if I jump in? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Zoom is so awkward. I think this is an awesome question. Thank you to whoever asked it. Um, that was like another thing that I really wanted to bring into my presentation. It is like, I, I, that was another thing that happened when I was being introduced to these concepts was looking around my classroom and understanding that everyone in my classroom looked like me and how um, that was, editing my ed education and perpetuating the way that all of us would go out into the field and act as clinicians. There is such a, a need for diversity and um, body diversity, racial, racial and ethnic diversity, everything. Um, and unfortunately, there was recently an, a New York Times article about um, lack of diversity in the dietetics field, which touched on a lot of what Hannah, Hannah mentioned, like these ideas that um, the way we prescribe nutrition interventions, the my plate, and that sort of thing is all derived on these ideas of like Eurocentric, um, very white narratives. Um, and that funding has been cut from a lot of the um, traditionally black universities that had dietetics programs. So a lot of the funding that that previously was around in the 70s was cut. Um, and so the academy, I think, really needs to step up. Um, and try to make some change because based on that article, I would recommend reading it. Um, it really highlights how many people who have, how many people have tried to make change within the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and how much pushback they have received. Um, and unfortunately that is, that is the way that a lot of people receive funding and that is how our curriculum is approved. Yeah, I would also add, I think kind of circling back to what Dr. Farrell was saying, like if we don't acknowledge the roots of where nutrition comes from. We're just gaslighting people in courses. You know, you have to, I remember sitting through courses where they would say like, you know, like, oh, black people have high blood pressure because it's genetic. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but we don't really discuss where these things come from. And we haven't really reckoned with how our field was built in this like eugenic way. And so you, it's not surprise like it's not a leaky pipeline if we're like actively making people who aren't white women uncomfortable in these classes and in these spaces. Um, so I think there just also needs to be like a really fundamental reckoning with like what our core curriculum is and how we approach the field. I also think a piece of that is not wholeheartedly embracing healthism. Like I think nutrition is really interested in this idea that people are more valuable if they're healthy. You know, like everyone wants to be healthy and. The reality is that no one owes anyone health. That's not a moral obligation of anyone. People like when I talk with my patients and they want to feel good, they want to live as long and as well as they can in their bodies, but they're not 
trying to get a certain A1C, they're doing that because they want to be able to do other parts of their life. And I think we need to recognize that it's not about like, metrics of health that people have to meet and more about making sure like we're, I, my job as a clinician is to support people in living the lives they want to live. And maybe that has to do with nutrition and maybe it doesn't. Um, but I think we get this like essentialism when we rank people based on, oh, you're a better person if you're a healthier person. And I think in terms of the fields of nutrition, as well as medicine, I've been to conferences and spoke at, you know, and, and eating disorders as well, is not only do we need to um, kind of um, go out and do that work of recruiting people into those fields, but we also need to look at the environment that they're being recruited into. You know, I've been to conferences, I've been to the American Dietetics Association conference. It's not a welcome place if you come from um, an other. And so I think that, and there's oftentimes this belief that um, in order to be comfortable, that person that's different needs to conform in order to fit into this environment versus like, what are we doing as a professional society a society to create an environment that's welcoming to everyone such that when we do recruit this amazing talent, it's a field that they want to stay in and that they're invested in and that they want to pour into versus like, I'm, this is just further perpetuating all of the stigma that I deal with on a daily basis. Let me go find some something else that is less um, uncomfortable. And so I've seen that quite a bit in professional organizations. And so there's, there's also that reckoning within the field of like, what are we doing to create this atmosphere that really um, fosters the idea that we're invested in this and invested in the people that can bring that, um, that diversity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for, for all of those thoughts. Uh, I do want to move to another question. I um, this is an audience an audience member question. I actually feel as though I'm asked this question a lot. Um, you know, being an advocate for uh, reducing weight stigma and nutrition research. So for anybody, uh, how do we reconcile the need for objective measurements in nutrition science research with the importance to not use stigma as a tool to get people to achieve quality health outcomes? Uh, what are your suggestions for moving from current messaging? Is the question specifically about like what outcomes should we be measuring? Is that, because I think that that's a lot of pushback that I get is like, if we're not going to measure weight and BMI, then what are we going to do? How do we measure like effectiveness of tools or interventions. And I think there's so many other things that we can measure. And I actually do sometimes consultative work around people that have been so weight centrically focused for so long, it's difficult for them to extract that from their research. And so we look at, you know, um, I don't know, you know, measuring how people feel, measuring their blood pressure, measuring their lipids, measuring those things that actually are a more direct reflection of our desired like health outcome, if that's what we're looking for, than being so weight centrically focused. So I think those that there's a lot that we can do, but we've just kind of used this blunt tool of weight and BMI for so long that it requires more thought to kind of um, look at how we can come at it from different perspectives. I also think kind of adding on to that, I. There are, there are definitely situations, like I've worked in a hospital, there are situations where you need objective measures, but I also think we need to consider why we don't trust self-report in our professions. And especially from fat people, we often question what, you know, I remember sitting in classes during my training and they'd be like, you know, people will say they're eating this, but like in reality, um, and that just hasn't borne out in the work that I've done. I've worked with kids for, like when I worked in the school-based clinic, I got to see young people for years at a time. And they would tell me like very deep secrets about things that happened to them. And I don't think they were lying to me about how many Doritos they ate, um, but there, I had been kind of taught to assume that. Um, so I do think we need to consider like, why don't we count? Like, why isn't how good our patient feels or how they feel they're doing a part of our evaluation of their health? Because that's a big factor. You know, if I have a diabetic patient and they're you know, managing their diabetes as best they can, and they feel good and are able to do the things that they want to do. I think that needs to be like, obviously, I'll also check their A1C and things like that. But 
I think that's also a factor and something that we should consider and value. And that's like, I think that is again, something that comes out of this idea of there are people that can be trusted and there are people that cannot be trusted. And that gets, that breaks down along race and gender and body size. Um, so I think it's something we need to think about in our professions. And, and I would just jump in there too, since we know that there are so many um, problems with actually measuring body size as any kind of indication of health, that it's really important for every practitioner, whether we're a historian or obviously if you're a, a health practitioner, to really question what's the impulse to measure the body in this way. And I would say that that impulse to measure the body goes back to a very, you know, the very historic desire to measure a body as inferior or as acceptable. Um, and so probably there's still even other, you know, problems with the kind of healthism that the better body is one that's showing better numbers, whatever, but particularly with the kind of measuring of body size, I would say to really um, be self-reflective about what is the purpose of this in the first place. Um, and um, knowing the deep historic reasons that the person, the purpose was to measure whether or not the person was kind of worthy of something, um, that it's, it's really important to check that. Yeah, all uh, very excellent points. I don't know if we quite have time for another question, uh, just want to be aware, but um, I just want to take the time to thank you all for joining us here today. Um, I'm so happy conversations like this are happening, you know, uh, you know, not just only at Friedman, but across, it feels like across the nation now. Um, and, and I thank you so much for bringing your expertise here. I know it was a true honor to learn from you guys and um, a real pleasure to have this discussion with you. So thank you um, and, and to the audience, thank you for being here with us today as well. Uh, the panelists have agreed to share their email addresses with you all if you have any further questions, comments. Um, I know a lot of people were asking about Sabrina String's book, so um, we can send that as well. Um, but please feel free to contact any of our wonderful panelists here today. They would be more than happy to speak with you about any of the topics discussed or any questions unanswered. So thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.